today I'm right next to the Charles River, sitting down next to the picnic bench, um, actually next to some bird poop, and I was wondering whether or not you can get airborne disease by getting staying next to bird poop. But um, so I'm doing this because this is in the sun, and for today's topic I want to talk about vitamin D and how a lot of people that you care about, I care about, may not be getting enough vitamin D and that it may not be affect it may be affecting their health in a bad way. Um, this is based on a New England Journal article that was published in July 2007. It's a review article. This is this journal is one of the most prestigious journals in the world and so hopefully this topic is going to be directly relevant to your health and my health. So why should you care? Well, not getting enough vitamin D puts you at increased risk for a lot of nasty diseases. Whereas getting enough vitamin D may have a role in preventing a lot of those nasty diseases like cancer, osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, autoimmune diseases, infectious diseases. This is all according to the New England Journal article. It might sound kind of crazy, but it's based on evidence and Dr. Hollick goes in detail on what he's talking about. All right, so some statistics. 1 billion people worldwide are estimated to be low in vitamin D, and that includes 40 to 100% of seniors in America and in Europe. So your grandparents, my grandparents may be vitamin D deficient. And young people, young children are also at risk for being vitamin D deficient, depending on the studies that they're looking at. Anywhere from 42 to 52% of teenagers are vitamin D deficient. And even healthy medical students and doctors 32% of healthy medical school students, doctors, residents at a Boston hospital were found to be vitamin D deficient, even though they were taking a multivitamin daily and drinking one glass of milk daily and eating salmon once a week. So the last thing that's kind of disconcerting about this is that women who are pregnant and lactating, they're also at risk for being vitamin D deficient. In this one study, 73% of women and 80% of their infants were vitamin D deficient. And this is even though they were already taking, 73% were taking prenatal vitamins, and over 90% was drinking 2.3 glasses of milk a day. And 90% was already taking um, extra fish. 90% was eating fish. So metabolically, what's going on? And what's happening is that if you don't get vitamin D, then you only absorb about 10 to 15% of the calcium that you're taking. 60% of phosphorus. So let's say you drink a glass of milk or you eat a bowl of dark leafy green vegetables and those have a lot of calcium but if you don't have vitamin D then most of that calcium your body is not able to absorb. So how do you get enough vitamin D? Well the best way is to do what I'm doing which is to sit out next to the picnic bench and have people, onlookers think I'm really weird but to be out in the sun for from anywhere from 10 a.m. to 3 a.m. But definitely don't be out in the sun for too long because then you're gonna get sunburn and that's gonna give you increased risk of skin cancer. But a reasonable amount, moderate dose of sun is good for you. Anywhere from five to 30 minutes twice a week in 10 to 3 a.m. sun is recommended. That's what the New England Journal article talks about. So five to 30 minutes depending on your skin pigmentation. If you have darker pigmentation, darker colored skin, then you're going to need more time out in the sun. Those 5 to 30 minutes mean without suntan lotion. So put on the suntan lotion after you're in the sun for about 5 to 30 minutes, depending on the time of the day. All right, so the reason why you want to make sure that it's 5 to 30 minutes without suntan lotion is because when you put on suntan lotion, you're blocking your skin, you're preventing your skin from making the vitamin D that you need. And this has been shown in metabolic studies. They've been able to show this through actual scientific studies that if you put on suntan lotion, you're not going to be able to make the vitamin D. And that's why make sure those 5 to 30 minutes, uh, Dr. Hollick says, it's without the suntan lotion. What about during the winter time? So if you live north of Atlanta, so North Carolina or Beijing or London, Russia, if you draw an imaginary line and that line goes across Atlanta and you're above that line, so for example, I'm in Boston right now, so that's north of Atlanta. During the times of November to February, the sun is not going to be able to trigger your skin to make vitamin D. And that's because the sun rays are too weak. So your earth, the earth is tilted in such a way that during the winter time, the sun is not powerful enough to make enough vitamin D. 
And so the only ways to get vitamin D during those times is through diet. You can get enough vitamin D if you eat oily fish. But most people don't eat enough oily fish. And as Dr. Michael Hollick pointed out in the lecture, when you cook the fish, um, you're losing vitamin D in the fish. What about through milk? That's oftentimes cited as the best way to get vitamin D. But Dr. Michael Hollick also took a look at this issue. And in a lot of milk products, what they, they say they're going to give you enough vitamin D, but when you actually test it, the vitamin D is not present in the milk in the amounts that they're supposed to be. And so getting vitamin D through milk is not necessarily the best way. And Dr. Hollick in a lecture, um, this is a lecture to nutritionists and doctors at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He said that a supplement is probably the way to go. Now, I'm definitely not recommending supplements in that I'm just a medical student and I can't make any recommendations, and so please go over this with your doctor. But what Dr. Michael Hollick has often talked about in his different articles is that you need to have a supplement during that time. And uh, he actually has a table of people who this is a table of when, what category you fall under and whether or not you should need extra supplementation. And the article goes over more in depth on things to do. And if you have trouble finding this article, I will, you, please email me, I'll try to help you find this article. Or you can also find this article in public libraries and your doctor should have the New England Journal of Medicine. So this table has a lot of recommendations on how much vitamin D and how to get it, whether through supplements or through the sun. And I just wanted to repeatedly emphasize, though, that definitely sensible sun, reasonable sun, not too much sun, because too much sun can cause sunburn and it could increase the risk for different kinds of skin cancer. In this review article, it talks about pushing up the limit to 800 international units as the recommended limit that everybody should take a day. Um, the recommended dosage that people should have through their food, through the sun, or through supplements. This is twice as high as previously. And so this is a pretty radical review article. But like I said, the New England Journal is pretty conservative. They don't usually publish quack ideas. And so this might be something to go over with your family or with your doctor, which is that 800 international units is the least um, that you should be getting through food or through supplements a day. So what are the objective facts? The objective facts are this is a review article, and review articles are expert-based, expert opinion-based, but they aren't actually studies. And so if somebody were to be very skeptical, they could legitimately argue that the trials and the studies that Dr. Hollick has looked at are metabolic studies, they're basic science studies, or epidemiological trials. What this means is that metabolic studies look at biochemical changes within a short period of time. Epidemiological studies looks at large groups of populations and tracks their trends. And basic science looks at cells, cellular, um, cellular level changes. The, for a clinician, for a doctor though, oftentimes the gold standard is the randomized controlled trial where you give half the group, in this case, vitamin D and other group, just don't give them vitamin D and see whether or not, okay, does it actually produce um, less risk of getting cancer? Do the patients with on vitamin D, do they have less cancer? Do they have less multiple sclerosis? Or do they have less autoimmune diseases, infectious diseases, things that Dr. Hollick believes can be cured or can be prevented with enough vitamin D? So that that's just to give you the more balanced perspective because in the media, I think they'll just say, one billion people are vitamin D deficient and you're gonna need more vitamin D. But for those, I have heard legitimate viewpoints which are that there's just not enough data. However, sometimes you have to wonder how much data do you actually need and how feasible it is to get those extra randomized controlled trials. Right now, because vitamin D is not a drug, you're not gonna have pharmaceutical companies backing up the large, um, large scale studies that are needed to definitively prove that vitamin D works. And also NIH, in certain areas of research, the budget has been cut uh, increasingly in the past few years. And so, how realistic is it to get a randomized controlled trial? Mm, that's really hard to say. And so, based on uh, this Michael Hollick article, review article that I'm talking about, it is published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and they usually are very conservative, conservative in that they won't publish uh, wacky ideas or crazy ideas or even risky ideas. Usually they try to publish articles that are well-grounded in the 
facts and, and evidence. And so, but that's the entire picture in case you wanted to know about that. Um, so thank you for listening. This is kind of a random video, but I hope this is a helpful.